So what I want to do today is, um, well, answer, first of all, answer my question, what is Old English and how did it sound? Um, when it, why, when, what, how it was? Um, I'm going to um, show you some, uh, some texts. I'm going to show you some words from the Old English poem, perhaps the most famous poem. Well, I should ask you, really, what would you think is the most famous text written in Old English? Beowulf, yes. I'm going to show you a little bit of Beowulf. And then um, after I've answered that question, maybe after 15, 20 minutes or so, I would like to teach you a bit of Old English. I'm going to, as you can see from the handout, you're going to uh, uh, learn to count up to 12. Uh, it's not Cumbric, um, alas, it's not, it's not as fun as that, but um, you can see it there. And, and um, a little bit on the vocabulary of the human body, um, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, hands and feet and so on. Um, and then we'll uh, talk about poetic language and we'll look at some riddles. So let's get going. First of all then, what is Old English? And the quick answer might be it was um, the English um, spoken before the Norman Conquest uh, in uh, mostly in southern Britain. Here's an example of it. It's from another famous text. I think there are two reasons why people might be uh, learning Old English, and I have to plug my own book now. I have a book on the um, books uh, bookstore. It's called Complete Old English in the Teach Yourself series. And, and what I say at the beginning of that is there may well be two reasons that you want to learn Old English. Uh, I'm sure there are more as well, but one of them would be because you want to study the literature or your tutor at college tells you you have to, to do it as well. That would be one reason, but there's also the, his the history side of it as well, um, to read the documents in the originals. And there was a lot of Old English written in uh, um, in uh, the uh, the period, which really goes from about 600, and you could say it stops at the Norman Conquest, but that's not actually true. It carries on until about 1150, when it starts to change into Middle English. So this is one of the, on the screen, you can see one of the um, historic, um, historic um, documents. This is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And um, it's the beginning of the Chronicle and, and in the original, one of the original manuscripts. And if you read it, it says uh, the first word is Britain, Britana, and the second word is Eland, the island of Britain. And then it goes, is echter hund mila lang, is 800 miles long. And there's a, a sign there on the second line, which is, it looks like a seven, that's an abbreviation, and that, that means and, and twa hund broad, and 200 broad. And here, sind on this elander, fief ye And there are, on this island, five languages. I'm about halfway along the third line now. And then it goes English. That's the first one. English. And then we get the and. And British. We're on the line four now. And Welsh. You can see that they had a, a sign for the W, which is not um, uh, continued into modern English. And the next one is and Schuttish, Scots, Scots, I suppose. I'm not sure if the scribe actually made a mistake there. Anyway, so we got Welsh and Scottish and Pictish. So he's making a difference between Scots and or Scottish and Pictish, and then and book Leden, and book Leden is book Latin, and of course in the period we're talking about, the early Middle Ages, most uh, written documents were in Latin. But what was unusual in, in southern Britain in this period is that um, the vernacular was also, also developed um, as, as a language of written record. And it goes on, Erist warren de buyand, this is Landers Britters, first were living on this island the, the Brits, the, the Britons. The Coman of Armenia. Well, that's news to me. I didn't know they came from Armenia. So, uh, so um, there were one or two uh, 
problems with this text, but you can see it, it's introducing us to the, um, the English language in, in a sort of work-a-day way um, as a prose text, as a document. If you turn on your handout now to uh, number six, um, this is from a poem, and you can see, uh, I think at first glance, that um, the poetic language um, was, was different to the normal everyday prose. It was much more archaic and perhaps harder to understand. I'm going to read number six to you, and um, then I'm going to ask you how much you understood. Ich wicht dir sag on weiche fähren, se was ratlich a wundram ye yearwood, have the fair of fate under wumba, on echtuwe uven on hridge, have the two fifth ru and twelve ergen, and six hevdu saga whati were. Okay, our task in the next perhaps thirty five minutes now is to equip ourselves with enough old English to be able to understand that uh, little poem there. Let's go back to um, looking at one or two images um, and discussing what Old English is and where it was spoken. Um, at the beginning of this period, so, uh, so the period I'm talking about is 600 to 1150. Um, at the beginning of this period, um, Britain was divided into many kingdoms. And some of them... Uh, were um, the inhabitants of these kingdoms were speakers of various connected Germanic languages. And these are Old English or Old Englishes. So you get Wessex, the West Saxons, and the Mercians. They are the, the March people, the people on the border, and the East Angles of East Anglia. And then you have the, the Northumbrians, north of the River Humber. Kingdom of York was ruled by the Vikings of about halfway through the period. You have the principalities of Wales, Gwynedd, Powys, Brecheniog, Gwent, and so on, um, the Celtic areas to the left, to the west. And also, Kingdom of Strathclyde, they think, was Welsh-speaking as well in this period, around 800, 900 now. And the Kingdom of Scots um, at the top of the map there. So the uh, Old English then was spoken um, in the southern part and the eastern part right the way up to um, uh, well up to Lothian really because the king of England in the 10th century gave Lothian to, to Scotland and, and this must be uh, one of the uh, origins of, of Scots um, as a, the Scots and Northumbrian are kind of sister languages if you like here's a little bit of um, uh, uh, old English grammar, just to show you one or two things. It's a Germanic language, and it has um, it has cases rather like in German. So it has um, so if you want to say the nobleman, you say the earl, but you you can add endings or some endings um, according to sing um, whether it's singular or plural, and whether it, it, it's um, an accusative, a genitive, or a dative. Um, and the word for the um, the masculine word was su. Um, if you know your German, you can see some connections between su, thorna, fes, and tham. That funny um, letter is referred to as a thorn, and that's a th sound. It's a d, the equivalent cognate in German is a d, and uh, so it would be der, den, des, dem in uh, German. So you can see some connections there. And in the plural, you also had uh, various um, endings on, on the word, on the definite article, and on the uh, noun, ends of the nouns as well. So the plural of aeol is aeolas, um, of, the, of the earls, of the noblemen, is thara aeolo, and to the earls, tham aeolum, which is rather similar in Icelandic, which is another uh, sister language. We also have a feminine, feminine nouns, and the word for uh, glove was seal glove. Um, and, and you can see that various endings there. Plural is rather similar. So, so grammatically, it's um, a Germanic language. It has the two tense system that you find in, um, in um, 
Germanic languages, you know, bas a basic present and a basic past tense. You have vowel gradation, so you can, and strong verbs, so you can say give, gave, given. Um, uh, and that was quite a, a common thing in uh, Old English. I'm going to show you um, a, um, a piece of metalwork now. And um, because it tells us something about the kind of, um, it also tells us something about the literary interests of the, uh, of the early English uh, speakers. Um, could anyone um, suggest what we're, we're looking at in the uh, in this uh, on this um, image here on this brooch, which was probably used to fix a cloak. Angels? Sorry, what? Angels? It's not as spiritual as that. <laughs> the the person in the middle could be divine wisdom. Uh, certainly, they have big staring eyes, but that might be a clue to to what else is going on in this picture. They loved, um, they loved uh, to, to be enigmatic and to tell riddles. Um, what is the person on, um, on the top left doing? He seems to be touching his mouth. What is the person with the hands behind his back doing? Am I giving you a clue? Um, bottom right, he's touching his hand. And the other person seems to have a very... Uh, prominent ear and he's holding his hand. I think what we have here are the five senses. And um, uh, let's have a look at number two on the handout just to, to, to see some of the parts of the body. If we look at, every, at the everyday language of, um, uh, of the Anglo-Saxons, if that's the right word to call them, um, you can see that basically their words um, have continued into modern English um, spelling and pronunciation has changed, but these are recognizable words. L let me pronounce some of these words. So, body, herved, I, uh, nozzle. Um, I'm sure you can guess what the translation of that is. Mouth. Um, air is ear. Swear, what do you think that might be? Neck, yes. So the, the alternative word, neck, uh, gives you that. The back was a ridge um, or back. Uh, axle or shoulder was the shoulder. Arm, ellenborger, hand, finger, thumb. Shoot a finger because that's why you shoot your arrows with. Cedar is your side. Wamb means a stomach. For some reason, the French word stomach has come into the English language, but almost all the other words for the parts of the body uh, go right back to Old English and they're still Germanic. Kneel and fought fate. Another thing about um, Old English vocabulary was that when it came to poetic, formal registers, high style, they loved to do compounds, putting two words together to form a new word. So we get uh, poetic compounds and the Icelandic word kenning has been taken on by the critics to describe the, the kind of uh, compounds which seem to create a picture. And these are some words to do with the body. Uh, we have feochbold, which means a life dwelling place, a life mansion. Feochhus is a similar um, idea. It means life, house, um, so the, the, the place, the house in which your, your life dwells. What do you, th what do you make of um, B, feoch hoard? If feoch means life, what about hoard? What do you think hoard should be? Treasure hoard, treasure hoard. So your body is your life treasure, the place where you, uh, the, you the, the, the life that you treasure um, is kept. And uh, C is um, a favorite um, Old English compound of the Irish poet Seamus Heaney, who studied Old English at Queen's College, Belfast. Um, Barnhus. 
Can you guess what? Hus is obviously house. So what about barn? B-A-N with a long vowel. Bone, yes. Stan means a stone. Barn means a uh, B-A-N is, is a bone. So a bone house is the kind of structure within which your soul dwells. <laughs> your bone house. If you turn over the page, um, here you get a, an example in... Um, Beowulf, uh, where it says a fair fold bold means um, a beautiful um, earth uh, earth dwelling is the name of the royal hall of Herot. And Herot is the name of the, the royal hall of the king of Denmark in the poem Beowulf. And Herot has come into modern English as H-A-R-T, um, as in... Uh, Hunting the heart, the white heart, it means the stag. And uh, Meduseld, which is taken up was by uh, another uh, old English enthusiast, uh, J.R. Tolkien, uh, for his Riders of Rohan, means uh, a mead hall. So he... Um, Tolkien, of course, was a professor of Anglo-Saxon at the University of Oxford, and his lectures on Beowulf were famous at the time and have been published since. Um, this is uh, Tolkien talking about the kenning, the, the poetic compound, Hronrad. A Hron is a kind of um, whale or dolphin. And Rad, you would think, means road, just as star means stone and barn means bone. But Tolkien um, doesn't approve of that translation. Um, he says it means the watery fields where you can see the dolphins and lesser members of the whale tribe playing or seeming to gallop like a line of riders on the plains. That is the picture and comparison that Kenning was meant to evoke. It is not best translated by whale road, which suggests a sort of semi-submarine steam engine running along submerged metal rails over the Atlantic. So um, I, uh, I have translated it whale road, but the, the great master... Uh, should be correcting me there. Let's go back to number one on the handout. And um, let's try the, the, the old-fashioned chant method. I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five, six, and it's your job to repeat these numbers as I say them. So, on two and three. Feo fif six. Seven acht nigon. Toon and love on twelve. Very good. Okay, bearing those in mind and the parts of the body, I wonder if we can now work out together the meaning of Exeter Book Riddle 36. This is number six on the handout. I'll give you um, a little bit of uh, glossing on the beginning of the poem. It starts off with the word itch. And this is the word for I. It's the personal pronoun, itch. Itch. And um, Old English used um, subject, verb, object, word order, but also subject, object, verb is quite common. So itch is the subject. Wicht means a creature. W-I-G-H-T in modern English. If, if it is modern English, it's a little bit archaic. So, uh, and then yeser is the past tense of the verb. It has a GE prefix in front of it, uh, which you find in, in German as well. It's a sort of perfective prefix, makes the, the, uh, the word that follow more complete. Um, so, I saw a creature. Um, where was this creature? It was on weher. There are two meanings of on weher. It could be on a wave or on a way. Um, so it's a little bit ambiguous. And feran is the infinitive. So I saw a creature travel on the, on the wave or on the way. Um, it was. This creature is feminine because uh, wicht is a feminine noun. So we say seo, it, was, was, ratlicher. And ratlicher is uh, an adverb meaning marvelously. And wundrum, 
let's see if we go back to our nouns, um, you can see that the um ending on the end of a noun is the dative plural. So the, the actual uh, stem is wonder or wundor in the nominative, a wonder. So wundrum is the dative plural and it means here with wonders. So we're getting seo was ratlicher, it was marvelously wundrum with wonders ye yearwood. Now ye yearwood is the past participle, so it means something like girded or equipped. So it was marvelously equipped with wonders, whatever this creature was. And now we're getting into the finer details and maybe we, you can help me translate now. Half dumb means had. It had feel feet on the womba. Okay, it had four feet under its stomach. On echtoa uven on hridje. And it had eight uven. Uven means up above. And hridge, if you go back to uh, number two. Yeah, on its back, on its ridge, yeah, on its back. So it had um, four f uh, feet under its stomach and eight up above on its back. Have the two fifth row. If you look at the numbers again, we didn't read it, but there are um, three words for two. There's twain, toi, and two, depending on, on the gender of the noun that follows. So have the two fifth row. So fifth row is that word with the, the thorn letter, which is like an elongated P. It comes from the, the runic language. It's the thorn, it's the TH sound. So have the two fifth root. What did it, two, what, two, what did it have? Fifth root. Feathers, yes, feathers is the, is, is the cognate word. It had two feathers and 12 ergan and 12 eyes. On six hirtu. and six heads. And then the riddle finishes. Saga, what he aware? Say what it might be. Say what it was. So I saw a creature uh, traveling on the wave. It was marvelously girded with wonders. It had four feet under its stomach. It had eight up on its back. It had two wings, feathers, wings, and 12 eyes and six heads say what it was. It's your task. Well, you were doing well, so uh, get, get in the language. Uh, now you've just got to pull the meaning together and we, we're there. The, 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 the thing is, um, it's traveling on the wave. Is that a clue? Yes, we're, the, we're almost there now, but now we have to explain the details. Why did it have um, uh, four feet under its stomach? Oars, right? We're nearly, we're, we're, almost, we're, we're getting warmer and warmer now. We've, we're going to solve it. So it had four feet under its stomach, the oars, but it had eight on its back, eight feet. Why? Because they're the rowers, aren't they? And four rowers, with their, their, their two feet each. That's eight feet on its back. And it had two wings, or feathers, sails, and 12 eyes. Oh, no, that's a bit difficult, isn't it? If there are four rowers, any thoughts, further thoughts? What kind of uh, ships did they sail in, similar to the Vikings, in fact? Were their eyes painted on the... Yeah, I think we're there, really. They had dr dragon heads at, at the fore and aft. So if you've got two dragon heads, I think that explains it, doesn't it? Then, then you've got um, uh, four, more, four more eyes. To, to One or two people are looking very skeptical of <laughs> the solution. <laughs> so the, the two dragon heads, four and aft, or in the bow and the stir, yeah, uh, and then plus the four or, uh, rowers with uh, two eyes each. So that's, that's 12, isn't it? That's 12 eyes. Uh, and six heads, because there are the four rowers and the, the, the two dragon heads. So it must be a, a, a very small dragon boat, is the answer. 
Okay, well done. What did they use these riddles for? Well, we think they might have been used for um, teaching um, people how to write poetry, you know, in, in schools. Because there are many uh, surviving Latin riddles as well. Because in the monastic schools, they were teaching uh, the sons of the, aristoc uh, the aristocracy uh, how to read and write in Latin as well as in, in, in English. And they were teaching them how to compose poetry. Um, uh, Latin hexameters and so on, and they used um, riddles by a man called Aldhelm to uh, uh, teach uh, uh, how to write poetry in different meters. So one possible uh, idea is that these riddles were, were used for, for that kind of thing. Good, well, uh, let's uh, move on to uh, Beowulf now and look. This is the manuscript of Beowulf. Um, there's only one copy in the world. If you find another, another copy in the, uh, you know, in your cellar or more, more likely in your, uh, in the roof of your house, then let me know. And the two of us can become very famous. <laughs> Beowulf <II>. too. <laughs> there's only one manuscript. For example, there are, I think, eight manuscripts of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. So Beowulf is pretty rare. And you can see it nearly got burnt away in a fire in the 18th century. So it's a bit tatty around the, the, the right-hand edge of it. I'm going to show you some objects which uh, introduce you to a few more thing, uh, things of the, about the um, uh, Old English language. My first um, is a helmet. And then we're going to look at a road, a floor, a shield and gold. And uh, they're slightly arbitrary choices, but in a way they they sum up some minor aspects of, of the poem, which is about a hero who goes on a journey, a kind of adventure which he takes on upon himself to free the king of Denmark from uh, the monsters that are attacking his palace. In the end, of course, he, 50 years go by, and he, oh no, I won't, I won't spoil it, you've got to go away and read it. Um, that's the beginning of the story, the first half of the story. Here are, here are uh, words. Grima, straight. So Grima means a masked helmet. Straight means a paved road. Fach, floor, means a mosaic floor or colored floor. Shield is a shield and gold is gold. We have the advantage uh, of archaeology, which assists us very much in our study of Old English, um, because as more and more is discovered, what we thought was simply the imagination of the poets is now being confirmed as actual um, objects in the real world of uh, the early English kingdoms. And this is um, a man who was buried in East Anglia, um, possibly King Redwild, who's mentioned by the Venerable Bede in his ecclesiastical history of the English people. And he's, uh, this uh, man who was buried uh, was very well equipped. Um, his equipment is now in the British Museum. But he was found in East Anglia under one of these mounds in the 1930s. Uh, they found all, all the treasure lying in, in, in an obvious symbolic arrangement around where the man must have been laid to rest. And this is the Grima, the helmet, as they found it. And this is what it looked like when it was restored. So that's Grima. Here is a strat. It's... Um, an Old English word uh, which has come into modern English as street and it's another area, uh, it, it opens up a whole other area of, of, of possible interest uh, for the study of Old English which is if you come from England and, and parts of Scotland, parts of Wales but if you come from uh, um, those areas then most of the place names will go back to Old English. So if you, uh, straight means um, uh, a long distance road, basically, a paved road. It's from, from Latin, strata via, a paved road, and it's come into English as street. Uh, in 
but the names of the old Roman roads, uh, what have we got, Watling Street, uh, um, uh, I can't think of any, my names of Roman roads have gone out of my head right now. But they tend to be called uh, street and have been over the centuries. And this is how people got around in medieval England, really, using the, what the Romans had provided for them. There is a, a, a line in Beowulf, straight was Starnfach, the street was paved with stone. Uh, the uh, path led uh, the men. Uh, bottom left there you can see an example of a straight going through the English countryside. Um, up above we see an example of an old English king. And uh, on the right, we have the earliest um, um, map uh, found in uh, Britain. Um, this is in an English manuscript from Canterbury. And you can see that Britain is bottom left. So this map goes from, uh, so we've got e um, south on the right and north on the left. Um, it's very northern. Uh, in its orientation. Maybe this person had been to the Orkney Islands because the Orkney Islands are absolutely massive. Anyway, straight is, is, is my next word. Um, and as I say, people traveled uh, along the straight and you could go on pilgrimage all the way from Canterbury to Rome and still can, of course. This is my next word. What I'm suggesting is that Old English was mainly a Germanic language, but it was borrowing from its neighbors just a little. And uh, the Latin language was providing, or, or Roman remains were providing, or adding to the vocabulary of, of the language. So um, when the English settlers uh, set up their towns, and town, of course, meaning means a farm in Old English, uh, tun. Um, and has come into lots of place names. Um, they came across old Roman villas and they referred to them as a fach floor, a colored floor or a decorated floor or a paved floor. And, and uh, there are place names in England like Forla and Forley, which seem to reflect this. And the, the word um, appears also in Beowulf. Here's a few lines from Beowulf. It goes like this. Hrava after them on fachna floor feind treadada. Now this is the story of Beowulf. Beowulf has arrived in Denmark. He's a young hero. He's taken on the adventure. And the king of Denmark entrusts his palace, his royal hall, to him for the night. Uh, this is a dangerous thing to undertake. The king goes off to his separate sleeping chamber, leaving Beowulf and his men in charge of the hall. Um, this is where the story gets gothic. Uh, the monster arrives. Can you see the word for the monster? It's in the second line, feand. It means, of course, um, uh, well, it, it's, it's cognate with fiend in modern English. And the origin of the ND is it's agentive. It means somebody who does something. So slepend means people who are sleeping. Feyend means someone who hates. Freyend, the word for friend, or one of the words for friend means someone who loves, a loving person. So feyend is a hating person. But it also took on those religious connotations as well. Christianity came to southern Britain in the, in the year 597. So even though this Beowulf is a story about uh, uh, pagan heroes in, in an ancient times, um, Christian symbolism is, is creeping in. And it may be that there's, there's some element of, of the struggle between good and evil in this story of Beowulf. Um, anyway, <laughs> let me translate. Quickly after that, rather after them, on fachna floor, feyond treadada. Quickly after that, onto the colored floor of the uh, royal palace, the enemy, the fiend, stepped. And if you want to know what happened next, 
then you have to read the book. <laughs> I'm going to finish now with um, one more riddle. And, and I want to just talk ever so um, briefly about uh, the poetic high style in Old English. Oh, the, oh sorry, there's, there's a picture of a fiend uh, grasp, about to grasp a poor unfortunate, it looks like, in this picture. Um, I would carry on with shield and gold, but um, let's move swiftly on. Here's another line from Beowulf. You mon a gold galdreb wunden means the gold of men of former times, former men's gold, galdre bewunden, wound round with enchantment. Galdre is a, is, is a word which mean, it comes from galan to chant. So those are my words from Beowulf. But this is the riddle that I'd like to finish with. It seems, it says, I was by the shore near to the seawall um, at, um, at the edge of the sea um, is where I dwelt um, firm in the foundation of my roots. There were few of mankind or humankind who were there to um, behold my dwelling place in a solitary condition. But every day the, um, the, the brown wave played around, and, but little did I think that sooner or later I was going to be speaking across the mead bench, over mead or bench. Moothless sprechen. Mooth is mouth, we know that. Moothless, without a mouth, speaking. What is the solution to this riddle? What grew up by the seashore and then becomes a symbol of communication? I think you like language, but you don't like riddles. <laughs> <It's very fresh. laughs> the um, the usual sen um, solution, the consensus solution to this uh, little poem is a reed pen. So it grew up by the seashore. It doesn't have a mouth, but nevertheless it can communicate over the mead bench. And the poem goes on to describe the, the process of communication and how uh, it can be sharpened by a knife and the right hand. And uh, it's an amazing thing is writing, isn't it? You can communicate without, without words, without a mouth. And uh, it sort of celebrates the idea of um, writing as, as, as a marvelous invention. I've just about finished, but I would like to um, speculate ever so briefly about how they perform this kind of poetry. It's very rhythmical, and you'll notice that it's, um, it, use, it doesn't use rhyme so much as alliteration. So each line is connected. It's divided into two halves, and they're connected by alliteration. Let me read it again, and you'll hear that the rhythm tends to change from one half of the line to the other. It was by Sunda, say well enough, at Mera Farother, Minum, you wonder, from Stadler Fast, fear any worse, when the that Mina there, on Arner de Eod beheld. So that you get a kind of poetry which is very um, stately and constantly changing its rhythm from one half uh, to the other. Um, this um, makes me wonder how they actually performed it because, um, and I'm going to have a go at doing it, and I'm probably going to fail. Would you like to hear me try? Okay. This is a Greek instrument. Um, it's called a jura. It's supposed to be a very old instrument. Originally made out of one piece of wood and the sound. My problem is, if you write a melody, the, ch the switching rhythm of the Old English poem means it's hard to keep to the same melody all the time. 
or you have to force the words to fit. So probably I'm going to fail. Anyway, I'm going to finish with this. Each was besunder, see well enough, at the mare of Paragon, from Stavlet Pass. Fee and he was, man a kunas, an an ilde, he had been held, un rezda, an seven serulich, and seven Sarulich success all and the sweet Raham. Yeah, th this is the thing about um, Old English, is that there were, there were kind of two discourses. The ordinary everyday language has carried on. A lot of those words still exist in modern day English. So there's another word for life, leaf, L-I-F. But this word feel, um, I'm sure there's some kind of Indo-European connection, but I can't tell you straight off what it is. But that's the poetic word for for life, so so when we were looking at, uh, at words, f you know, for for the body, you you, you get um, a word like body that's carried on into modern English. Lich, as only in well, actually, it survives in the word like. What's it like? You know, what's its body? What's its? Um, but then you get these 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 compound these poetic words like. Feochbold, you know, life house and uh, tr life treasure and things like that. And these, these poetic words haven't survived into a later English. So two aspects then of, of Old English I've been trying to put across to you today. Yet, uh, what do we know about the dialect varieties of Old English? Um, we we mainly have uh, records of West Saxon because the capital city of Wessex was Winchester and King Alfred, who the Victorians thought was King Alfred the Great, um, and they called him the first King of England. Well, he wasn't really, but he was King of the West Saxons and he fought back against the Viking invaders and his descendants um, took over from the Vikings, so they pushed up through... Uh, into um, Kent and Mercia and Northumbria. And, and so West Saxon became the standard language. So most of our records are in West Saxon, but we do have a little bit of Kentish and a bit of East Anglian and quite a bit of Northumbrian. So we know that there were different dialects. In, in the north, they, the present tense ended in an S. You know, he goes to town. He goes to Tuna. Whereas in, in the south it was hey Garth with a T H, hey Garth to Tuna, and these kind of. 